Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I look forward to talking with you about uh, improving the represent representativeness of online surveys and some of the things for you to keep in mind. And um, just to start, I wanted to kind of il illustrate uh, il illustrate what I'm talking about with the story. So, my middle son Nick uh, this summer, so he's uh, going to be going to coming to university, and he wanted to uh, go to. So we live in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. And he wanted to look at uh, universities in um, uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Baltimore. And uh, so our trains aren't as great as your trains in, in Europe and Asia. So uh, we tend to turn these things into road trips. And I realized that you know we were going to be in the car uh, for about 30 hours. And uh, this is the dash of uh, 2007 Hyundai Azera that I that, that is my car. And uh, as, as my son complains, it was sort of that, it was right before MP3 players you know, worked their way into dashboards. So it's, a, it's an old-fashioned car, uh, which takes CDs and cassettes. And uh, I said, you know, we're going to be driving, uh, it ended up being 1,600 miles. Um, I said, you know, why don't you go through the house, gather a whole bunch of CDs uh, that you want to listen to, and pick some at, so that we have uh, plenty of music to listen to. And, and I'll admit I was a little nervous. Um, uh, traveling with my teenage son and finding out what music uh, that we would be listening to, and uh, he loaded we, we, the the car takes six CDs at a time, and he loaded it with the Beatles, uh, They Might Be Giants, Flood, Album I Love, Nirvana, uh, Bernie Ladies, um, Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits, and this tech uh, guy who I'd taken to see, Jonathan Colton, and uh, I was like, wow, you know, th this is this is great, you know, I really like the music that you picked. And he said, uh, Dad, you, you do know you're the only one in the house who owns CDs, right? So what we had was a, a classic example of, uh, of sampling error. He was uh, giving me back <laughs> uh, my music because uh, everyone else, I, I was slow to move to MP3 players, and everyone else had done that long before me uh, in my house. So uh, uh, sampling error is, is the, the main thing that I want to talk about. Um, I, there are lots of types of error. The total survey error talks about uh, many different problems that can arise with survey research. Um, when you're re selecting respondents, non-response error um, at unit level, which means that they haven't, um, individual respondents of particular demographics, for instance, haven't even taken the survey. Uh, once they take the survey, you know, there's non-response error, there's measurement error. Uh, if you, you're using interviewers, there can be interviewer error. Uh, there's mode effects. There's all kinds of error that, that we need to keep in mind, but I'm really just going to focus today on sampling error um, as it relates to online surveys. Uh, the big reason that this has become such an issue is because online surveys are so much more affordable than um, telephone probability surveys. So uh, to do 400 interviews um, by telephone here in the U.S., um, about five-minute survey, uh, you'd do 8000 uh, it'd be $8,000 just under. And um, to do a uh, online survey, you know, it would be two thousand. Uh, so a much cheaper method. And unfortunately, on the commercial side, that means many people trade off the higher quality uh, for the lower price. And uh, they're, they're not always aware of what they're trading off. Um, on this uh, on this panel survey that I did, and of course, we know that sampling error doesn't apply in that case, but. Um, uh, they're there because uh, when, when they bring that up, you know, it's, I will often try to shift the conversation to, well, if you're interested in probability survey, you know, here's what we can do. Uh, but once they sort of understand the higher cost, uh, they typically um, make the compromise for, for less accurate results. So um, I want to talk about, uh, you can do probability sampling on the Internet. I want to talk about um, how that's done, um, probability sampling in general. Um, then probably online panels, which are the way you can do probability sampling on the internet, open online panels that we know and love, um, weighting, quota sampling, sample matching, which not very many people are doing, it's sort of the next evolution of quota sampling. I'll look at river sampling, intercept samples, and then I'll talk to you about some of the practical ramifications of this. So um, Krosnick, John Krosnick is a Stanford professor. Uh, you're going to see a lot of the sources um, throughout this presentation are from the research that he's done. He's not the lead author on many of these great papers. He's a, a co-author. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount of research on research. Um, and unfortunately, not, not a lot not a people on the commercial side of the business 
are as aware of his research as they should be. So uh, he does a survey uh, fairly regularly where he looks at probability samples versus non-probability samples. I've seen him pers I've personally seen him present it twice. He, uh, it's, I think he's been updating it over the last 10 years or so. This was from the 2011 paper. So uh, this was a range of sources uh, that he used. Uh, Source A was an online was a telephone probability uh, sample. B was a probability panel, uh, which I'll be talking about in a little more detail next. And then the rest were online panels. Um, all had you know, 950 responses and up. I think the the median size was 1,100 responses for each of these. And you can see that the average error uh, differed dramatically. So the probability, the average absolute error. So they asked questions that were they had benchmark data from the U.S. Census. So these were all U.S. surveys. Um, that had the lowest um, average error across all the items that they measured. Uh, and the highest was very high for one, uh, which was panel, panel I, which was 12% uh, average absolute error, so way outside uh, what we think of as typical margins of error. And uh, the way John presents this is he's like, people often come up and ask me, you know, well, which panel was that? So I make sure I don't use them. Um, and the correct way uh, to think about it is that any panel that you're using could be behaving like that. And um, I think that's kind of, so that's how John would handle it. I think that's a little extreme uh, because you can see many of the other panels um, are, are doing some of the practices that I'm going to lay out here to try to reduce that, uh, the range of that error. But if you are just running a, a, a panel and not paying attention to some of these, uh, you can, in fact, see variances that large. And so it does uh, require us to do our diligence when buying from a panel company. Uh, so the the panel uh, error, uh, if you look at the average absolute error, uh, the probability panel was six times more accurate. So it was 2%, uh, 2 points uh, versus 12 points. So here we're comparing them um, uh, by their differences. And you can see that uh, for the probability online panel versus some of the other um, uh, traditional convenience panels, difference isn't that much. And so certainly when people are doing the price trade-off analysis, they're willing to sacrifice that, that, that higher quality for the lower prices of online panels. Uh, so those were the average errors. We always say, and we say it and I think people forget it, which is, you know, um, we're 95% confident uh, you know, plus or minus 3% uh, for, for a sample size of, uh, of about 1,100, it'd be a 3% uh, margin of error for the probability panels. So we say, you know, we're 95% confidence in within uh, plus or minus 3%. But even with probability panels, you know, what that is acknowledging is that one times out of 20, it's, it's outside of that. And so here we can see cases where it was outside of that. It was um, just under 10 points on the, on the, on the telephone survey. Uh, just under 12 points for the online probability, and and one of those panels again, the same panel um, uh, that had the largest uh, uh, average error had the largest absolute error of 35 percent, which I, I think all of us would be horrified uh, to have that. Um, but you can see that the largest errors were not that much dramatically higher on some of the other panels. Um, there's no easy way to talk about this with clients. Uh, but it's something that I always, you know, it, the language is there, and I always just kind of use the same example I use with you. One out of 20 times, you know, our survey results are not going to actually reflect the reality. Um, doesn't it matter how good the probability panel is, uh, I'm sorry, the probability method is, it's just the nature of the of probability research of sampling theory that sometimes we're going to miss. And uh, we always need to keep that in mind. So what are the key elements that make um, a probability uh, sample um, so reliable uh, that make them a probability sample. The first is coverage, so that you have a known non-zero chance of selecting any member of the target population. So in the U.S., uh, it really was random digit dialing, uh, making up telephone numbers. There was a, a, an understanding of which blocks of numbers were residential, which blocks were commercial. Uh, and they developed that into science to know that they were selecting members of telephone households households with telephones, which was 98% of the U.S. population had a landline. Um, that, that part was really understood. And obviously the external selection part is, well, we're making up the number and we're calling you, and we're not calling you once, we're calling you multiple times, um, sometimes five, six, seven, or more, until you participate in the survey. So that external selection is, important, is an important part, that we chose you to participate in our survey. 
you didn't choose yourself to participate in the survey. We chose you. If we're, if we're uh, running the nightly poll for Gallup, you can't opt into the nightly poll for Gallup. You're going to be randomly selected um, to do it. Um, nowadays, obviously, I have a sampling frame that's landline, they have a sampling frame that's cell phone only households, and they have different ways to uh, make sure that that's representative. But at its purest, these are the two key elements of probability sampling. Now, what we've seen happen is that the response rates to probability sampling have declined dramatically. I think when I started in the industry in the 80s, um, you know, if it was under 80%, people would be upset. Now it's frequently under 20%, um, under 10%. And so uh, Ray uh, has pointed out, and Andy Pettit has pointed out, which is with, with uh, response rates that low, you know, the external selection item is kind of going away. If they're not, if, if we can't actually get them to take it, um, and one out of ten have taken it, you know, is it truly behaving like a probability panel anymore? Um, and he asks, you know, do we decide that all those people uh, who opted out weren't part of the population to begin with? Uh, and so there's been this concern that um, probability panels don't work anyway, probability sampling doesn't work anyway because re response rates are so low. Well, actually, uh, uh, another paper that John Krosnick co-authored, uh, co uh, Holbrook, Krosnick, and Fent, uh, they looked at um, response rates. Um, they looked at a range of different studies with low response rates uh, to high response rates, and they found that um, while response rates, high response rates were more demographically representative, it was a much weaker effect than they ever suspected. Um, and in the RDD work that colors a lot of academic uh, research in the United States, uh, the lower response rates were not reducing the quality of the survey of, of the survey's estimates, uh, the survey's projections to the population. One of the findings that I take from that is that probability sampling is very is a very robust method and it often behaves well even in circumstances where we're not living up to its ideals, um, as in circumstances with low, low response rate. But um, obviously, for, for most of us, we, we do very few uh, RDD studies these days. Uh, one option that, that's not always talked about um, is a probability online panel. And so I wanted to uh, talk about those in a little more detail. Uh, I know um, some, some uh, European countries have these. Um, in the US, we have knowledge networks, which I'll talk about. Basically, you build a large panel using some sort of method. Um, in the U.S., it was address-based sampling, so the U.S. Post Office has a good record of every address in the U.S., uh, and so they relentlessly invited candidates to join the panel through mail campaigns. Um, and here was the key, uh, was if they didn't have uh, a computer or a tablet, originally they provided people web TVs back when they first started, Knowledge Networks did, and then they were providing laptops, and if you, did, if you had a laptop but you didn't have internet connectivity, they'd give you, uh, you know, internet connectivity. Um, so basically, they were taking a panel that was not online uh, and giving them um, access to online. So very expensive, as you can imagine, to do that. Um, but what they found, uh, you know, is that this online panel has performed as, almost as well as RDD. Um, so we could say there's a transitive property of probability sampling. A random sample of a random sample is highly accurate, uh, even though the net response rates are low. So again. Holbrook, Krosnick, and Fentz said low response rates seem to be okay. And you can say that with these random samples of random samples, you've got low response rates, uh, and yet the method is still pretty effective. It's $900 per question uh, from knowledge networks, so it is expensive. But um, uh, you know, it, it does produce an accuracy uh, using an online methodology. Uh, and I do have to wonder if uh, some entrepreneur out there is looking at smartphones and uh, thinking that they can build a new mobile probability panel uh, where they give people who don't have have them smartphones um, and maybe hit a lower price point uh, uh, for that for that side of the, the business. So uh, unfortunately, they, these panels are pretty impractical for low incidence. Uh, you have to build a really big panel to be able to to do some of these groups that I've surveyed in the past eighteen months: uh, mothers of children, uh, four and under families with chronically ill members, uh, board and card game purchasers, ebook purchasers, um, middle managers, small business owners, all low incidence populations that um, becomes very cost prohibitive to do 
uh, in a in a online probability panel because the panel is too small to give you sufficient sampling uh, in any one of those segments. So good at representing uh, a general population or high incidence subsets, uh, not very good at representing low incidence subsets. So bye bye probability um, can't afford to do an RDD probability survey. Um, the probability online panel we either can't build one or it's too expensive to use. Um, this is a great quote from Donald Campbell, a social scientist. He said, where randomized treatments are not possible, we must do the best we can with what is available to us. And uh, so I'm going to talk about what the best is that's available to us. And um, I'll, I'll start with uh, what by itself is not the best, uh, which is uh, open online panels. And uh, just to remind you, you know, anyone can join a, an online panel. Um, uh, they typically join for cash or prizes. Um, they're often fielding surveys through web intercepts, collecting responses from non-panelists, so they don't actually always behave like panels. Sometimes they're bringing in um, respondents through that way. Sometimes they impanel those respondents for future studies. Uh, sometimes they're just sort of drive-by respondents. Um, they can produce highly inconsistent results from study to study. So um, one of the things that I've seen um, people say is, well, I did a random sample of the panel, so we can uh, calculate you know, a margin of error. Um, well, you can calculate a margin of error for um, that panel, uh, that panel's population, but it's not what typically people are implying or trying to do. So a random sample is a convenient sample, it's still a convenient sample. However, if you're doing longitudinal studies, a lot of people look at panels for trackers. Um, I would encourage you to see if you could do random sampling of the panel uh, on an ongoing basis because you're using that same panel, uh, I think you're going to get higher uh, rate of consistency results for, for longitudinal studies. Um, now, if you just do a panel survey and you don't specify, hey, I want census representative or population representative, you can get very different results. So here was a panel survey I had uh, where um, it was anyone could participate, and for some reason we had a very youth-oriented uh, proportion take this survey. So 80% uh, of them were 34 or under. Um, compared to, uh, so we had 17% who were uh, above 35 compared to that representing almost 70% of the U.S. population. So not at all representative of, of the market. And um, obviously online panels, uh, they're not, these are not panels that are giving people access to the internet. They're not giving them um, uh, laptops and uh, broadband cable access. And so you do have the concerns about, well, Maybe we can represent the online population, but we can't necessarily represent the overall population. And Pew Research uh, has done some great studies um, on you know, what exactly this looks like. While internet penetration in the US is at high levels, it's at 85%, uh, you can see it's kind of plateaued out. And the bad news is it really means that the 15% who aren't on um, the internet, haven't been on the internet, um, they are materially different uh, from, from the population as a whole. Um, so they tend to be uh, poor, obviously. Um, they, they tend to be more rural. Um, they they uh, tend to be um, uh, older. Uh, those are populations that are not uh, on the internet. Uh, they may be um, in the US uh, Spanish-speaking Hispanics. Um, so all groups that are using the internet less. So when you're doing a survey, you know, those are groups that are all going to be underrepresented. And uh, the ones that you are surveying are, are, are not, in some ways, probably not like the populations who aren't online uh, in some key ways that might matter to you. So uh, a common way that people try to fix this is through weighting. So let's look at uh, a simple and more complicated example of weighting. So um, post-stratification weighting is when you ha have the survey results in and now you're going to weight them. And it's a common solution for removing sampling bias from convenient samples. Sometimes you'll hear it said, it's, oh, it's, it's just a simple process of arithmetic. And I'll give you the simple process of arithmetic and then talk a little bit about why. There actually are editorial decisions here. So um, cell weighting um, is, we're going to take a very simple example. We're going to divide our, our, our survey respondents into men and women and into 18 to 54 and 55 plus. Uh, so those are our four cells that we're going to look at. Now, a lot of cell weighting studies will have between four and eight cells, the ones that, I, that I've reviewed. Um, and here in the for this is for the U.S. So um, if we look at uh, uh, women 18 to 54, it's a population of 79 million. Uh, we have 199 responses, so just under 200 responses that we're at, we're using to represent this population of 79 million. Meanwhile, we have 43 million women 55 and plus, but we only have 17 responses uh, that we're using to represent those. 
Now, if you used a projection weight, it's a weight to try to make it map to the total uh, population that you're interested in, uh, each uh, woman 18 to 54 would represent about 400,000. Woman uh, 55 and up uh, would represent 2.5 million people. So uh, a dramatic difference there um, uh, in those populations. And as you can imagine, uh, again, you're, you're assuming that these small sizes are that the, the, the people that you did reach online are representative of the ones who aren't. Uh, also, if you look at that cell, you're going to see that you don't have a lot of people 80 and up, uh, for instance. And so you're not really entirely representing um, the actual demographics of, of that cell. Uh, one technique that tries to take this to the next level is looking beyond four or seven cells um, to really almost, uh, uh, if appropriate, assigning a unique weight to every individual in the survey. Um, so this is a, an example of a seven-dimensional weighting system, uh, and this is what mo most uh, academic researchers are using these days. It's called rim weighting or raking, and basically what what they do is they'll take they'll, they'll take the data and then weight it, and then they will rerun those weights and weight them again. And so the previous weight is always an input into the process. So we'll say, okay, we looked at the data; it's not representative by age. We're going to weight it to make it representative by age. Okay, now we look at the data with those weights. It's not represented by gender. We're going to take those weights as our starting plates, reweight them so now it's reflected by gender. Oh, it's not represented by region. So we're going to go through each of these in turn, reweighting. Um, and then by the time we get back to age, uh, okay, obviously now we're no longer perfectly matched on age, so we're going to reweight. So it's a loop, um, and programs like uh, uh, WinCross, SPSS, uh, the programming language R has some algorithms that, that uh, other people have written. Uh, where we'll apply this loop. Sometimes they'll, they'll rather than go just in, in a circular order, they'll figure out which one they're doing the worst on, wait to that, then figure out which one they're, they're doing the next worst on, wait, wait for that, and so on. Uh, most records have uh, only if they match on all seven of these variables uh, are they going to have, have the same weight. Uh, and so it's, it's highly accurate. Um, it, it's uh, algorithmic. Now the editorial process, I said, you know, that we're, that it's uh, uh, it's not a simple formula. Is you know, which of these factors do you want to wait on? Um, and many companies will, uh, many market research firms will, will quibble over the, which proprietary measure uh, is better to use. You know, which in the UK, which newspaper do you read? Uh, it might be a proprietary measure. I think that YouGov uses um, uh, certain. Uh, Introspect attitudes towards introspection uh, might be a, a measure that another firm uses, and so forth. Um, and so, uh, people will have different opinions about which items they should be waiting on in the first place. Sometimes specific to uh, a study, uh, and sometimes more generic to the research that they that they're doing. The implicit assumption when we're doing waiting is that the people we surveyed um, in one of these groups are representative of the people that we did not survey in that group. And I think I've alluded to this with the, with the cell sizes by, um, uh, by age. And uh, just had one of these that I was looking at for a client where, uh, you know, we actually had some, some respondents um, in their 80s uh, who, who used this particular service, but don't really have enough to um, accurately represent a cell um, of 80 and up. Uh, we just don't have enough respondents there. So um, that's always something to keep in mind. Many commercial researchers will weigh convenience samples because they're hoping that it's not going to harm the data. Uh, they're thinking, well, at least it will improve quality. And worst case, it's redistributing the demographics to match the target population. So I'm not going to show you uh, demographics where you see that 70% of the people who took the survey were women. I'm going to show you demographics where it looks like 50% of the people who took the survey were, were women. And so um, those are reasons why, uh, why people weigh. Um, but there are times when, um, you know, weighting does not actually improve the accuracy. Um, and uh, so I was uh, at the uh, American Association of Public Opinion Researchers uh, event um, where they had a class uh, last summer on weighting that I attended. And uh, it was primarily academics. Um, there were maybe a few other commercial researchers like me. At the end of the session, I, uh, I asked a question. I said, well, you know, we dove right in talked about all these waiting, you didn't say when we shouldn't wait. And um, you, you know the saying, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Well, for academics, I think that was a stupid question because they laughed at me. Uh, and they said, uh, well, no, you always wait. And um, I, I fundamentally don't believe 
fundamentally don't believe that. Maybe for their their world and their um, maybe they're using better samples. Um, but a lot of times, uh, you know, I would get data where I'm uncomfortable waiting it because I know that it will not improve the representativity of the results. Waiting the waiting stage to adjust is too late. The combination of coverage error and non-response in online panels creates a sample that is beyond fixing post hoc. We need to do more at the selection stage. And so that is the next thing that I want to talk with you about. Um, and the, the, the common approach is quota sampling, where, um, so my, my son Nick, who uh, was doing the college tours, one of the things that uh, you have to take a test in the U.S. called the SAT, and one of the things that I remember when I took that test is uh, they have these, th these, these sort of analogies. Um, and uh, I'll get into that analogy here in a minute. I just want to make sure I'm on the right slide. Um, okay. So uh, if we look at the, the cells that I showed you before, men and women, uh, two different age groups, what quota sampling says is we don't want the, uh, the weights to be so dramatically different. So let's try to fill each of these cells. So let's try to get exactly 133 men, 54 and under, to take this. Let's get 61 men, 55 and up to take this, whereas before we only had uh, 15. Similarly, let's get 72 women, 55 and up, where we had 17. You still need to wait because um, you, you can see that uh, um, each, uh, each man is representing 595,000 men, each woman is representing 599,000 women, um, just because of the rounding. Um, but waiting now has a much uh, smaller effect on the overall results. Um, and I, not only are the, is the weight lower, uh, but the results are more likely to be accurate because you're now extrapolating from a larger group, hopefully a more um, heterogeneous group than, than you had before. So quota sampling, you divide your sample in cells, recruit to fill those cells. Uh, for instance, once 50% 1 of respondents are women, then you don't accept responses from women anymore. Um, obviously, quotas do increase the price. So one panel vendor uh, had a nice breakout. Uh, so for 200 interviews, it was $1,000 for no quota. It was 1,500 for three quota cells, and it was $2,000 for 12 quota cells, uh, which would be like a three by four matrix. So the more quota cells, the more you're spending, because more people are starting to take the survey and then throwing out. And then what always happens is you're kind of in that point where most of the survey, you've got 90% of the results, but you're waiting for one or two low incidence quota cells to fill. Um, often those older demographics, uh, and so um, you're extending the fielding time while you're waiting for that to happen. Now, quota sampling is often just dismissed offhand when I go to academic uh, events, uh, so public opinion researchers don't have a great opinion of it, but most corporate researchers seem to have a pretty good opinion of quota sampling. And um, I think the reason uh, for this uh, goes back to uh, Dewey defeats Truman in the U.S., uh, so President Truman was reelected despite that headline. Um, Prior to this election, you know, quota sampling had been a pretty, pretty uh, accurate method of predicting presidential results. Um, this was looked at as a failure of quota sampling. Um, you might argue it was a, it was a tight race, and so uh, you know it was outside outside the range um, of what you could expect from from many sampling methods. But quota sampling had been pretty accurate until this. After this, they went more towards um, a probability sampling as a method. But for many commercial researchers, quota sampling is uh, sort of a best uh, uh, a best vehicle that we have. Now sample matching um, takes us a little further. So I talked about my, my son's SATs where you have to do analogies. If apples are to oranges, um, kumquats, how are, what, what vegetables to kumquats? So those sort of analogies. So um, I talked about cell weighting, and so rim weighting is to cell weighting. So raking or rim weighting is to cell weighting, the way sample matching is to quota sampling. So when I showed you quota sampling, I gave you these four cells. Um, just like we had four cells in cell weighting. Um, but in rim weighting, everything, every, every, every response could have a different weight. With sample matching, you're not trying to fill four to 12 quota cells. You're trying to fill 400 cells, for example. You might have, if you're doing a survey of 400 people, you'd have 400 cells. So you're looking at um, uh, recruiting a 57-year-old African-American woman with an associate's degree in Newton Falls, Ohio a 21-year-old white male high school graduate of mass, and 390 cells like that. So very detailed cells. Um, now you, you might imagine, well, how am I going to come up with such cells? Where do these cells come from? 
And basically they come from a, a mathematical model. Um, in this case, this is uh, the United States. Um, so here's a population distribution um, in the United States. Uh, higher peaks like New York City there are where we have more people. And uh, so the way YouGov has approached this is they've taken census data, uh, they've taken the American Community Survey, which is sort of an expanded long form of the census. Um, and from this, they're basically building records for every adult in the U.S., you know, uh, what their age, gender, race, education, region is. They're not actually identifying these people, but they're using this. Uh, their voter registration, um, religion, um, they're identified with a minor party, um, an ide ideology scale. So they've built a model of the population. And um, you can actually take the census data, uh, and I've done this, and build a model um, pretty easily um, using those first points. And now, um, with that model in hand, um, what they do is they say, okay, we're going to take a random sample of this model we built. We found that 57-year-old African-American woman with an associate's degree in Newton Falls, Ohio. So that's in the database. And now we're going to look in our panel, and of course, we don't have that exact person in the panel. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to try to find the person who's closest. And so they use a proximity function. And this goes back to medical research. It's been done for 20, 30 years. If you look up sample matching, you'll find some medical texts. And so we're going to look at um, uh, distance in age, gender, physical location. And when we do that, we find someone in the panel who's a 59-year-old African-American woman with a GED, which is a high school equivalency, um, in Warren, Ohio, the next town over. And we're going to invite her to take the survey, and we're going to hope that her results are pretty representative um, of the other person. And what, what they find by sample matching is that when they do this over and over again, uh, in fact, it greatly improves the representativity um, of the survey. So um, sort of quota sampling taken to um, its logical extreme, you know, one quota per respondent, one, or, uh, one cell for each respondent. Now I want to look at um, river sampling and then intercept samples before uh, bringing, uh, bringing it all together with some practical recommendations for you. So river sampling, uh, you've probably seen these ads when you visit different sites. Uh, your opinion matters. Um, click here to take a survey, and then they'll often use that to impanel you um, in the survey, or sometimes they'll just run you through a survey that they're fielding. Um, now, the interesting things about panel participation, it's meant to bring new blood into the panel, um, and hopefully by doing that, keep the panel representative, because we do find that being in a panel changes people's um, performance, behavior, attitudes. Um, and, and in some ways, it's actually good. Perform uh, so there are practice effects, uh, which is the major difference for pan steady panel participation. Uh, and basically, like anything else, the more you, you do it, the better you get at it. And it's the same for taking surveys. People who take surveys uh, again and again um, uh, do a better job uh, at answering attitudinal questions. They become more introspective, uh, more aware of themselves, and better able to more accurately report on themselves. Um, so those are good things that happen from regular panel participation. Um, and those are seem to be the more major effect. Um, again, this was another Krosnick study with, uh, with Chang and Krosnick. There are some negatives. Um, stimulus hypothesis, asking about future activity prompts um, that activity. Um, so, you know, if you're uh, doing research for a brand, uh, you know, ask them about when they will buy the brand next, not are you going to stop buying the brand. Um, uh, and they've done studies where, you know, asking people um, uh, if they were going to vote, uh, and then checking the voter logs, um, those people did vote higher than the control group. So there is a real stimulus uh, effect. Um, the more surveys they take, they're exposed to more things, and so they are less like the general population. Uh, Wendy's uh, restaurant chain shared an example where they had done um, a survey, and they were getting all these, and they, they realized after they looked at some of the qualitative results um, that that it was. Uh, the results they got were biased by a study they had done in the past on salad offerings. And some of the people were taking, um, I think it was a concept test, they were taking some of the ideas from that and bringing them to this survey. So they were not, they had, they were aware of things that the general population would not be aware of. The other thing that can happen is uh, people can leave the panel um, uh, non-randomly, and so your panel's represent representativeness can be changing over time. Uh, for instance, say um, someone competing with on Honda, it's a long, boring survey. People who take the survey decide, I'm not taking any more surveys. Uh, so now, now you've just changed the panel where it now has fewer Honda um, car owners than it did in the past. Um, so it's less representative along that dimension. 
a big key, you know, really is panel participants are introverted, um, so they, they, they like to think. Um, most of the panels that uh, I use, you will see that they have very few, uh, they tend to underrepresent people without any college experience. So people with just high school degrees who never went to college uh, for whatever reason are, are much less likely to take surveys. And part of that is because um, people uh, enjoy the, the, the mental thinking of, of uh, taking surveys. Obviously people on panels like surveys, otherwise own panel, we did, we did a, a study where people talked about, you encourage them to think about things about themselves they hadn't thought about in the past, and that was one of the things that they appreciated about taking surveys. So um, because of th those concerns about panel conditioning, um, you know, there's been uh, interest in intercept samples. So uh, it can be as simple as uh, you're reading the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and here's a survey they want you to take. Um, it's going to be three quick questions about Pittsburgh and the Olympics. Um, or you're, you're visiting a, a news site, and cool. uh, you have to answer a short uh, one to ten question survey before you can see the rest of the article. And um, civic science actually kind of pioneered this first, uh, and then Google uh, Consumer Surveys came along, and also RiRi um, does intercept surveys. Um, they're often kind of described as if they're this wonderful probability sampling because it's a random selection of people. And while I, I do think um, most internet, uh, most most people on the internet do uh, consume news on the internet, and I'd like to actually see a study that contrasts that population a little more. Um, the problem is you're not externally selecting these people. So they're coming to, to the site to read an article. You're asking them to take the survey. If they decline, you have no way to, or if they close that page, so maybe it's a soft decline, you have no way to sort of entice them, encourage them, reach back out to them to try to get them to take that survey. So you're totally missing external selection. Um, interestingly, topic salience really seems to affect these. So the, the monster truck picture there, uh, so Riwi was kind enough to share with me a case study where you know they did a survey on monster trucks, and um, basically the the population who took the survey was um, disproportionately male. So men, women were much less able to take it because it was on a subject that didn't interest them, and again because there's no way of external selection, there was no way to get those women to take the survey on monster trucks. Uh, so there's definitely still bias in this in this method. It is not pure. Um, probability sampling. So I've covered a lot. How, what, what can you take away in the next uh, study that you do? Um, basically, one of the key findings uh, that I had as I researched that is that, as I said, probability sampling is very robust. And even at times when it's, we have, we're taking certain elements of it away, um, we still often get results that behave um, uh, behave as if they were a probability sample. So the probability panel, where you're randomly doing random sample of that random sample, works very well, for instance. Sample matching, where the randomness has been displaced to the selecting members of the population to match in the panel, um, seems to greatly improve the results. Um, weighting, uh, which was originally applied just to sort of a last dedication to quality on the, uh, the random sampling, folks um, you know, can improve the results with some of the caveats that I've given. Um, if you have an open panel, um, a, conv a random sample of a convenience survey, as I said before, is not a random sample. Um, so you really can't extrapolate it from them the same way. But if you're doing longitudinal work from it, definitely do a random sample. See if you can do a random sample of those people so that at least you're representing that panel over time. Um, APOR has historically, so the American Association of Public Opinion Researchers, they've historically been against um, non-probability research. Uh, they really feel like it's eroding uh, uh, the ability of the industry. But they, they are starting to come around a little bit, sample matching. Um, you'll have a, hear a lot of heated arguments for it, but there are for and against it. Uh, but there is more consideration of a technique like that. They are, however, diehards on they don't want you to report an error margin on non-probability samples. And that's one I have a tough time with because, again, just like a probability sample, um, I think we need to make clear to our users of our data that uh, these are the results we gathered. Uh, they might not reflect the population for many reasons. Um, and so there's always that chance that, the, that they're outside of reasonable bounds of, of errors that we expect, just as they would be with a probability sample. Um, those error bars would be larger. 
um, you know, in a non-probability sample. So some of my recommendations for you, when you're sourcing sample from a panel company, as we saw from Krosnick's list uh, of a panel firms, you know, some panel companies do a really poor job uh, at making sure their panels are representative. And obviously those are companies that you probably don't want to give your business to. Um, when you're evaluating panels, ask how they select respondents for a given study. Um, don't assume that waiting is a cure-all, that when you get the results, you can wait them to fix uh, to fix the results if you have certain cells with small populations. Um, look at doing quota sampling to bring those up. Um, while you can't report margin of error from a sampling frame, you know, think about uh, de facto error ranges. Make sure you have a conversation about uh, the, the, the quality and accuracy of the data. And there's a lot more um, that uh, I could talk about this, and I look forward to your questions. Um, I do encourage you to uh, read the report that Reg Baker shared. Um, uh, which was a, an APORT task force on non-probability sampling, which went into a lot more detail on these techniques. So Bitly, uh, APORT 2013 has this report, and uh, I look forward to your questions. So as I said, uh, sample error is just one, one thing that we need to keep in mind. Uh, and so um, when I am up against a, pure, uh, a probability sample purist, um, I do like to point out the leading questions that they asked, the acquiescence bias, the mode effects, and the other things that are eroding the, the accuracy and reliability of their data because it's a lot more than just sampling. So thank you for your time.